Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about Japanese feudalism and the rise of the samurai. I think you guys will like this one. Let's sit back and enjoy. So we left off last time with the Heian Kyo, the Japanese golden age, where Japanese culture becomes Japanese, which is really cool, right? So we talked about at the end, though, whereas the wealthy, the aristocrats, the courtiers are going and focusing on manners and focusing on beauty, etiquette, all of these things, how many folds are in their fans? The rich were rich, but the poor were so poor. And we see that the land is going to become lawless and dangerous. So we talked about how in order to compensate for that, the Japanese lords, the daimyo, are going to start hiring their own personal police. So like I was saying, the rulers were too occupied with court life, you know, being fancy schmancy. Peasants were unhappy. People were rebelling and fighting. Think about it. If your emperor just worried about partying the whole time, you'd be a little upset while you're starving. And so to get food, many peasants became bandits. They became thieves. And then we even had pirates and outlaws. They're attacking farms, attacking those aristocrats' estates. So like I said, they wanted to go do something about it. So... While this is all going on, when they get their private armies, they start fighting each other for land as well. So we're going to have something called the Shogun coming into power. Now we had two very powerful clans uh, fighting. Uh, we have the Minamoto clan fighting the Tara clan. Now, Minamoto Yoritomo winds up going and taking over the government. Now, what he does is he doesn't say there's no emperor anymore. He doesn't say he's the emperor. Because remember, the Japanese thought the emperor was a god, or at least semi-divine. So therefore, he winds up going and um, giving himself a new title, Shogun, but keeping the emperor in power as a figurehead. A figurehead is someone who has an important title, but no real power. Think about how there's a queen of England today. She doesn't do any governing. The parliament rules England. It's the same idea. The emperor was there for ceremony, but not to actually make decisions. The shogun made the decisions. So we have the uh, Kamakura shogunate, which is going to last from 1185 to 1333. Now, um, there'll be many shoguns. Um, of Japan and from different time periods, but we're just going to focus on the Kamakara, which is going to be the name of the city um, he rules in. So let's look at this feudalism. So what is the system created? Well, we have the feudal system, which will be very similar to what we're going to see in Europe with our next unit. It's political, economic, and social system, and it's all about loyalty, land, and military service. So it's all about loyalty, land, and military service. So what happens is we're going to have the daimyo being the landowners. And I'm not quite sure why this chart is choosing to put the daimyo and the shogun on the same level. Because really it should be shogun and emperor on the top, with the emperor having the power and name only, whereas the shogun was the true leader. Then the daimyo would take this whole area, and they'd be the wealthy land owners, the warlords, they are going to go give land to the samurai so that the samurai will go and fight for them. Now, peasants are going to be involved in this and artisans and merchants because they're going to wind up being on land, most likely owned by the daimyo. And from that, they are going to be protected by the samurai. And that's why they pay their taxes to the daimyo for protection. So we see these interlocking relationships of receiving land in order to um, serve. So the peasants do the farming, and that's why they have the land that they're on. The samurai do the fighting, and that's how they get their land. And the daimyo have the land and have an interest from protecting it from the bandits. So we have um, our first shogun, which of course is going to be Yortomo Minamoto, which we see pictured over here. Uh, like we said, this is a military dictatorship. The emperor is there, but he doesn't have the power. 
Now, there'll be times in Japanese history where some emperors will try to take more power, uh, and some shoguns will be weaker than others, but this is the Japanese government until the United States comes and opens up Japan with Admiral Perry. That's a great story for another day, unfortunately. So just to make sure we have this, because this is important to know. The Japanese emperor, he's the figurehead. No power. The shogun is the military leader who rules the country. Now, he says he's doing this in the emperor's name. So he's going and saying, oh, yes, um, the emperor would like me to do this. I'm helping the emperor out by going and ruling Japan for him. So let's talk about the daimyo. Now, these guys are minor warlords. They're going to hold a ton of land, um, and they are going to have samurai under them. And there are going to be many times where they're going to battle each other. Uh, like I said, they are the people who are directly interfacing with the samurai. So let's talk about those samurai, which I know many of us have probably been excited about as soon as we knew we were talking about Japan, right? So they are going to be professional warriors, and they had noble families typically. Um, samurai status was inherited. Um, you could declare yourself samurai um, at any time, uh, but you had to have the goods to back it up. You had to be able to fight. You had to be able to go and have the equipment. So this took a lot of money and often why you had to already be rich or really prove yourself and have a great daimyo lord to help you out. Now the word samurai means those who serve. And of course they serve in a military function. They are warriors. Uh, and they had a warrior code to live by called Bushido, which demanded that they are courageous, that they are loyal, that they were willing to sacrifice their lives, they're fair, they're honorable. The Japanese um, honor for the samurai is going to become the most important thing, actually, where Japanese uh, samurai will often choose to die rather than be dishonored. They say that you, you live once, but your name lives forever. Um, so with that came their loyalty. Um, so a samurai would swear loyalty to the daimyo, and they would fight to the death for them. Um, the beginning of the samurai, they were uh, not so honorable in a lot of ways. They're more like glorified tax collectors. But as this evolved, there became a huge air of going and serving and um, sacrifice and courage and fighting. Um, now, one of the things is the samurai weren't just all about fighting. Um, the tea ceremony, which we'd get to learn a lot about if we were allowed to go to the Walters this year. I'm so sorry about that. You know, the art of um, drinking tea a certain way, ikibana, ritual flower arranging, poetry. The samurai did it all. Um, and, you know, a samurai, they would go into battle ready uh, for the end. We'll get to that a little bit more later, though. So just to review, review with Bushido, because this is something we want to make sure we know. It's the way of the warrior. And the most important tenets are honor. Like I said, their lives are are more important or less important than their honor that they will go and do everything they can to maintain their honor um, even at the last of their life honesty being truthful courage and of course fighting skill that's what we really think of with the samurai even though it's not all just about fighting with the samurais and you know so samurai they would often compose poetry before they go out to battle. They'd have their, you know, they wanted their last poem, their known. Some samurai, uh, if it was going to be a particularly um, scary battle, they would um, burn incense in their helmet before going out to battle so that if they were killed, um, the typical way to prove that you killed the samurai is you would take their head. Um, and so that it would be a sweet fragrance for them. They didn't want to offend their enemy with it. The way samurai is actually fought is pretty interesting too. We we picture these huge, large scale battles, but often what would happen is um, it would be a series of individual combats. Um, a samurai would go up. He would announce himself, his pedigree, his lineage. My name is Colin Kenny. My father, uh, or excuse me, my name is Colin Kenny of land. Uh, 
Red Hook, and my father was Edward Kenny, the electrician of Red Hook. So they go announce that, and part of the thing would be then the enemy would say, "I am so and so from here, my father of this profession," to make sure that they were worthy even to be fighting each other. They wouldn't want someone who's an experienced samurai fighting an unexperienced samurai because then it wouldn't be honorable for the experienced one to win the battle, of course. Pretty cool stuff. So let's uh, look at some of the um, what we have for the clothing. So, of course, you got your underwear. It looks real comfy, doesn't it, right there? Um, it goes all the way around your neck and wrapped around. Uh, you got to have that. Um, it would also be padding um, to help make it so it's harder for an arrow or a spearhead to go through. So there was a functional reason for it to cover um, your entire chest. Uh, a lot of vital organs in the chest area, and we definitely don't want those pierced with an arrow or a spear. Then you'd actually have a kimono on there, which in providing another layer. Soka is actually very strong. Um, and so not only does it look beautiful, but it would have the functional aspect of giving you more protection. It's thin, but these layers help uh, stop something from piercing you. All right, a little bit more. Uh, then you've got your pantaloons. Uh, your pant Now, you want to have it loose. You know, we look at the European knights and how they had this armor. It was very rigid. They couldn't move very well. With the samurai, they wanted to have a lot of freedom of movement. So that's why they have these loose pants. You know, you'd have shin guards, of course. Um, often leather, sometimes cloth. Uh, and the cool thing is with a lot of their... Um, um, things like the shin guards and their brocade that they're going to put over top. Um, they would have pockets in it to put iron bars uh, to provide them more uh, protection, obviously. And these iron bars, they're going to be, you know, narrow strips so that they still have the freedom of movement, um, but they will be protected. Uh, one of the things that I am so excited about is not this. I thought I was on the other slide. My apologies. This is not exciting. It's kind of crazy. Uh, this is called um, seppuku. So if a samurai believed he was dishonored, um, if a samurai lost a battle but then was not killed, they might decide to choose ritual suicide. Uh, now, seppuku, um, it's pretty horrible, and probably not that many samurai went along through it, although it has happened in history. Um, in fact, as early as the 1970s, um, these men claiming descent from the samurai um, stormed into a Japanese broadcast uh, studio and did this on live TV, which is horrifying. Um, there's a look of complete, total serenity and control in the man's face as he is literally plunging his um, short sword into his tummy. Then he goes uh, across his tummy. And then he goes up at an angle um, to basically disembowel himself. And part of the reason of doing this is it was actually a extremely painful and slow way to die. Um, but that's what they would do. Um, you often would have your best friend um, behind you with it, with his katana ready. And um, if you showed any hesitation or couldn't go through with it, uh, your best they would go slice down and cut off your head but they would actually leave just a little bit of skin on your neck so that your head wouldn't roll around because of course uh the japanese about politeness etiquette beauty uh, that would be obviously be offensive to have your head rolling around after that horrifying huh <laughs> uh, now as i was saying though uh which i am kind of excited about uh girls always ask uh were there any female samurai and there were um on a Bugaisha, she was a very famous one. Uh, women would have things like the katana, but they mostly train with things like the naganada, uh, which is going to be basically like a sword on a long spear uh, to give them range to make up for the fact that they're typically not as strong. The most famous of all female samurai, of course, is going to be Tomoe Gozen. Uh, there's a series of uh, manga comics about her. She fought um, actually in the war that... Um, caused uh, Minamoto Yoritomo to become shogun of Japan. Anyways, that's um, our discussion on the Japanese samurai. I am 
uh, excited to get to talk about this with you finally. It's one of my favorite um, aspects of studying Japan. I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there's going to be an optional reading for Tomoe Gozen. Uh, and I have some other cool um, like comics and things that hopefully I'll get to share with you all as well. I hope you guys are staying safe. I miss you. Have a great day, everybody. I'll see you next time. Bye.